Hello and welcome back to Fall Broadcast Week 2. We're your hosts, Ranger Madison. I'm Ranger Allie. And I'm Ranger Claire. This week we have more tips for visiting as well as our peak check, which Allie will hit in just a second. But we're going to be talking all about hiking and same as last week, drop your questions in the comments and we'll be trying to answer as many of them on camera as we can. But just know that if we don't make it to your question, we'll answer them again later in the comments once we make it down the mountain. Yeah, so peak check for this week. Um, first, I want to go over temperature. We are wearing jackets this time because it's so cold. Um, but that is really good for our fall color progression because the colder it gets during the day and at night, the better the color will be in the coming weeks. Um, right now, in the higher elevations, we're seeing a little bit of color change. We see some reds and yellows in our maple trees. Um, the red Virginia creeper, which you can see climbing up the trunks of the trees, sometimes on the rock walls along Skyline Drive. I've also been seeing some sumac, and that's kind of near the, near the walls as well, and that's bright, bright red. Um, yellows from the goldenrod. And then in the meadow where we are, you can kind of see that our ferns are turning kind of gold. They're not as green as they used to be in the summer. And we have a little bit of silk coming out of the milkweed, which is really cool. It looks like little clouds floating around our meadow right now. <laughs> um, we do have some rain in the forecast, potential rain in the forecast this weekend. We're not quite sure how much we could get, but the good news is, and Neil can attest to this, he is the uh, person behind our cameras right now. He <laughs> loves those foggy damp days that have kind of a dim background because they make all of our fall colors pop and it's so true we can share some pictures later you'll see throughout the fall season we'll share some pictures like that so don't let it put a damper on your weekend plans because it is still just as beautiful up here when it's raining mm -hmm. but as Alyssa said just keep your eye on hurricane ian make sure that you check your weather before you come we may be experiencing some rain in here and there may be some fog on the mountain and there is a possibility of wind and down trees. So just be watching the weather before your visit, but no need to be too worried. Right, we'll keep you updated on our social media um, sites uh, just because we are expecting some wind and rain. We just don't know how much yet. Um, that could also lead to some potential hazards on the trails if you're planning to hike this weekend. Um, if it does get as much rain, that it could cause some flooding in some areas. So be cautious around stream crossings. Um, old rag could be a little bit dangerous because of the, all the rocks, they get really slippery when yes. it <laughs> rains. So just be careful if you have plans to go to old rag. And then also if you're hiking in from the boundary um, to White Oak, just be careful in those areas as well. We'll keep you updated on our social media. So mm -hmm. do, do check in, especially if that hurricane would track our way. We're not sure what it's going to do yet, um, but if you are planning to come into the eastern boundary, that area is very susceptible to flooding. So if we get that extra rain, you might want to check to make sure because sometimes we have to close those trailheads because of the, the flooding potential over there. Mm -hmm. We also want to say that our hearts go out to all the families that are in Florida dealing with the impacts of Hurricane Ian right Absolutely. now. Mm -hmm. So. You also, Ranger Claire, you had yep. some uh, things to talk about well, with just, Old yeah, Rag. I have a couple of <laughs> updates for you. Um, just if you're plan as you're planning, you know, your trip to Shenandoah this fall, some good things to know. We found out uh, from Delaware North, who is our concessioner, that they are pretty much booked on the weekends. Um, you might get a cancellation, especially this weekend, uh, that you, you can pick up a reservation for a Friday or Saturday night. But for the most part, they're booked through, the, through October. Um, so what you want to do is you want to hit that boss for weekday time off. You want to get <laughs> some weekday time off and get on out here to see the, the beautiful colors and also to avoid the crowds if you can come during the week. I also want to talk a little bit about um, what the situation is with Old Rag. As you know, we're doing a pilot system over there, a pilot program um, that we hope will improve, will improve the visitor experience um, and protect the resources by limiting the number of people that hike each day. So you need a ticket, you need a day use ticket. They're only one dollar um, because it is a pilot program. That will last through November 30. So when you get your ticket, um, then you and you, you can come on out to Old Dragon hike on the day of 
your ticket. And again, those are limited to 800 total. The tricky part about this is 400 tickets for each day are released a month or, or 30 days before the day you want to hike. Then the other 400 are released five days. So let's say you want to hike Old Rag on October 8th. So on October 8th, if you, if you went into rec.gov today to buy your ticket, it's going to tell you that it's sold out. There are no tickets available. That's because that first 400 has, has already been claimed. They've all already been claimed. However, on Monday at 10 a.m., they will release an additional 400 tickets. So you have to then go back in on Monday to get one for next weekend. And that's every week. So right now we're showing sold out for all the weekends in October. But none of the extra 400 have been released yet. And that happens each Monday for a Saturday at 10. Of course on Friday, if you want to come on Friday, they're released on Sunday. If you want to come on Sunday, they're released on Monday. So five days. And right now we're not filling any other days but Saturday for the um, weekend. So again, a great reason to come during the week. Yep. <laughs> so keeping with our hiking um, topic this week, Maddie is going to go over a few of the essential um, parts of our app, the NPS app that you can download and then search for Shenandoah and on our Shenandoah website. And so she has an iPad and though we planned for this to work, <laughs> Unfortunately, there's going to be a little bit of a glare, but you can go through the motions with Maddie as she is moving throughout the app and the website. Okay. How's Neil's motioning me to come forward? There you go. How's, how's this, Neil? I think that's better. Yeah. Okay. Well, here I have our website pulled up. So if you wanted to, you could follow along with me. It's nps.gov slash Shen. So right now I'm just on our homepage and right under unbelievable... Um, and the Ticket to Hike Old Rag is this large, lovely photo of a backpack hiker with the title, Go Hiking. So you'll want to click that and then that'll bring up more of our information about potential hikes that you might be interested in. So on the next page, we have some hiking basics that you'll definitely want to check out and read a little bit more about before you plan your next hike. It just gives you a little bit of safety, which we'll hit on some more. And then we have our recommended day hike section. Hiking is a really big thing in Shenandoah. It is kind of our our main thing, aside from camping, I will say. Um, so if you want to come and do something in Shenandoah, hiking is an excellent option. So on our hike day hikes page, we have a couple different options. So we have all of our hikes sorted by name. We also have all of our hikes sorted by location. So if you know you're up in the North District anywhere, if you know you're around mile five, that you'll be looking around hikes around five and 10, something for that for you to do. Or if you know if you're in the South District, you'll be looking maybe mile 100. We also have um, also sorted by distance. So we have short hikes, medium hikes, and long hikes. And those also break down into how strenuous the hike is. And there's more information about that on our webpage. And then also on our app, if you have not already downloaded the NPS app, I highly recommend it. It's what I normally use for planning my hikings in Shenandoah. So what you do is you download the NPS app and then you go and you search for Shenandoah and then this is our Shenandoah page on the app. So if you see here, we have like what to see, things to do, where to stay. And if we scroll down to day hikes, it'll bring up a whole list of recommended day hikes. And similar to our website, they have, we have moderate hikes, strenuous hikes, hikes to waterfalls, hikes for kids. So really it's an excellent way to sort of plan your trip and it really, we have something for everyone. So give those two resources a check. It's a Thank good you. idea too. You notice when you, when you get to that app, you'll see a little toggle switch that says download offline content mm -hmm. with a little question mark. You toggle that switch over and let it download before you come to the park. Because as we've talked about so many times before, mm -hmm. there's not good cell service throughout the park. And so that will allow you to use the app even when you don't have good cell service. So download that offline content when you, when you get that great app. Yes, for sure. 
so since we've gone over a couple of our housekeeping tips, we are now going to bring on two special guests. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Cindy and Tegan here, and we will let them introduce themselves. Maddie is going to step off yes. screen. <laughs> um, and I'm, then I'm going to start Claire. monitoring questions, so if you have questions, drop yes. them in the comments. Claire in the chair. Yeah, Claire okay. in the chair. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, so um, while we have Cindy, and Tegan on screen. If you guys have any questions for them at the end of our interview, make sure that you put them in the comment section and we'll make sure to answer as many as we can. So let's do introductions. So Cindy, if you don't mind telling us who you are, what you do day to day, and then Tegan, you can take over after that. Okay. Um, so I am Cindy Sorkier. I'm the chief ranger here at Shenandoah. So I oversee the law enforcement program that includes the emergency services, so EMS and search and rescue, as well as wildland fire, and the fee program. So the, all the uh, super happy, smiling faces you see when you come to the entrance station and the welcoming campground staff. And I would say day to day, unfortunately, mostly in an office, so I really love when I get the opportunity to come out and talk with you guys. Great. <laughs> All right, Tegan, you're up. <laughs> My name's Tegan. I'm a ranger with Preventative Search and Rescue. Um, and that means uh, you'll find us on trail at trailheads. And we make sure people know where they're going, that they're being safe, and they're prepared for the hikes. And when there are emergencies in the backcountry, we switch into the search and rescue mode and we go and make sure that people get the help that they need. Great. So when you all are in the park and you're interacting with visitors, what is the main goal you want them, that you have, that you want them to take away from a conversation you have with them? Why don't you answer first, Cindy? <laughs> um, I would say the goal is for the visitor to be prepared, which I think you guys did a great job of sharing some of the ways that they can research um, before they get here and making sure they know their abilities, having a plan for where they're gonna go, asking, uh, you know, rangers like Tegan for questions if they don't know, that's that's why we're here. I would say the goal is for the visitor to have the best experience that they can. And so that means, um, you know, respecting the resource, respecting other visitors, but also asking questions and making sure they're comfortable with, you know, not overextending themselves or right. getting into right. tricky situations. <laughs> Tegan, you probably have a lot of safety messages you have to convey to visitors at the trailheads, right? Yeah, and it's really just about keeping you safe so you have the most enjoyable time in the park. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, so when visitors, so I'll give you an example. When visitors are at the trailhead of a waterfall hike, what are some key points you tell them before they start? I make sure they have uh, close toe shoes, plenty of water, and that they know what the terrain of the trail is. Like Dark Hollow is very steep and rocky and a lot of people don't know that before starting to hike. And also <laughs> waterfalls are not meant for climbing. That's <laughs> really important. Waterfalls are not meant for climbing. <laughs> Stay on the trail. Yeah, I would say. Yeah, we have that in our key messaging on social media too. So <laughs> try to hit it everywhere. It's the most dangerous that people take in the park, wouldn't you say, Cindy? Yeah, we have had numerous incidents of employee injury, serious injury and fatalities, unfortunately, around waterfall areas where people have left the trail and they've put themselves in a situation that's extremely dangerous, like we just mentioned, it's very slippery, um, not really meant to be climbed on. And you're talking about the visitors are doing that. Visitors are doing that. Yes, and it's causing, yeah. So, you know, we've had to do um, uh, airplane hoist or uh, helicopter, helicopter hoists. And yeah, yeah it's, it's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And there are places where you can go rock climbing in the park, just not waterfalls. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, while we're talking about hiking, let's go over some of the 10 essentials. I know Tegan brought a visual aid, kind of stealing 
Ranger Claire's yeah. thunder. Oh, I'm the one that has a big one. Yeah. Hold it. So if you guys, if you both want to tackle this, kind of go over some of the essentials that a visitor should have when they're hiking in the park. Yeah, so you should bring all these things when you go hiking. Because even if you think you're just going to be out for an hour, you never know what circumstances might arise. So um, these three right here, I think are no-brainers. Uh, water, snacks, first aid kit. Um, the next three, you might think, well, my cell phone does that, but you know, you don't have cell service in this park and batteries die on your phone. So you want to make sure you have maps, a whistle, because if you do get in, find yourself in trouble, a whistle's going to carry farther than your voice, and a light source, and a backup for your light source, either another set of batteries or a second flashlight. Um, you also want to make sure you're appropriately dressed, you have the right shoes, Maybe bring a second layer, it is getting colder, so you never know. Maybe you'll want a second layer on your hike. Um, you want to check the weather before you go and make sure, you know, it's not the weather's not gonna the temperature's not gonna drop drastically or um, this rain coming in. And also keep in mind that the sun is setting earlier now. Yes, thank you for hitting on that. <laughs> yeah, and make sure you tell someone where you are going. So what trail you plan on doing, who you're hiking with and when they when they can expect you to be home or hear from you when you're done with your hike and um, have contingency plans for what you do if something does go wrong on your hike so if something does go wrong what should a visitor do to contact help <laughs> so um even if you don't have cell service still attempt to call 911 because all cell carriers are required to take calls to 911 just because you don't have cell service doesn't mean everyone does not have cell service. Um, you may have to rely on someone else if 911 does not pick up. You might have to rely on someone else coming up trail and having to relay a message that you need help. Mm -hmm. um, you can get to any visitor contact station, the visitor center, the fee station. They'll be able to radio for help to good. get people to you. Yeah, that's, those are good options. That's a question that we get pretty often, so it's good to know. Um, are we done with it? We can put our visual aid down. Unless you want to say something about it, Cindy. Um, I would just say something that's not on here, but I think is very important. That's part of the, um, sort of that preparedness is knowing your own physical abilities and your um, limitations, I would say. We often have visitors that you know, they might have all of the things that they need in their backpack, but they pick a trail that maybe they're not familiar with or is a lot more difficult than what their abilities um, are. And so they can, you know, become dehydrated, they can um, just exhausted to the point of not being able to continue hiking. There are a lot of ways to kind of get yourself into trouble, so to speak. So yeah. I would say, hey, um, have all of those 10 essentials still make sure that the plan you have is is something that you're actually capable of doing um, and then you know like Tegan said to always call 911 if you if you need help yeah. and hopefully if that doesn't work you're on a trail where there's visitors and somebody can relay we do get that often good good that's good to know everybody's looking out for yes. each other yes. <laughs> unsure about a hike that you think you're not doing and you don't know maybe to get call for you uh talk to your ranger stop by the visitor center first and they can point you on the right trail you want to that's good for your ability yeah that's great yeah you know i think one of the things we have lots of, of ways for people to learn about the hikes before they come to plan well we have we have planning tips um and so really a Talk a little bit about personal responsibility, you know, and the fact that when, when you're going to put yourself in this situation, it's, you take precautions in everyday life, every day. You know, when you get in your car, you put on your seatbelt. So when you're coming to the park to hike, you should have that same, how am I going to take care of my myself? Because with some of the rescues we've had recently, you know, that takes our, our people power to that person um, who is injured. And then we don't have as many people for other things that they, that they can help with. Yes. Um, I would say that being 
responsible for yourself is very important. Obviously, we are here to serve the public and we are here to help, but we, you know, if we are saving someone else that has gotten into a situation, whether it be through reckless behavior or not, right? Because accidents happen. Um, but if all of our resources are helping or involved in that situation, and now there's another situation, um, it could be a very long time before someone gets to you. And so that's another reason why having those things in your backpack is important because you need water and you need food and uh, you know clothing in case like we mentioned, you didn't plan to be out on the trail that long, but you know maybe you twisted your ankle and you just can't go. Um, and so we do ask that there is not an assumption that plan B is automatically someone is gonna be there um, instant to come to the rescue. Uh, eventually we will come, but you need to be prepared for that possibility that you might be on your own for a little while. Um, and, and we all have a role to play. So we can't, we can't protect the resources. We can't protect everyone on our own. We need the visitors to take that self, <laughs> self <laughs> acceptance of risk and, and safety right. on, you know, themselves. So yeah. Kind of switching gears now. Um, so if you're not hiking in the park, you're probably driving on Skyline Drive. So there are a couple do's and don'ts of Skyline Drive. We have Cindy here to talk about parking because that's one of the. <laughs> so what are the do's and don'ts of parking on the drive? Okay. <laughs> so this is going to be super busy time in Shenandoah, and I would say that there are several places that get very busy because they are kind of the hot spots of where everybody wants to go. And I know it might be really disappointing if you come here with the idea that you're going to hike Dark Hollow Falls, for instance, and all the parking is full. Uh, there are lots of other trails in the park, and we would encourage you to find a place that's not as crowded, that has sufficient parking. It's going to be safer for everyone. You can come back another time and do that trail that you have originally planned. The issue is that when the parking lot fills, then people start finding their own places to park. And generally that's okay if the vehicles are off the roadway in a safe location and they are not blocking any part of the roadway. Unfortunately, what we see frequently in the fall is people are dedicated to that place. They came here wanting to go there and they're gonna find a place to park regardless. And so um, sometimes they go off the road driving especially with the way uh, the road is very windy so sometimes you know if you come around a curve and you're not expecting there to be a vehicle blocking the road then it's it's pretty obvious what can happen there so we really ask that you park in the designated parking areas and if the area is super crowded just go to another location to have a hike or you know an overlook there's lots of overlooks. There's hundreds of miles of trail, so there is room for everyone. <laughs> yeah, that really goes back to just doing your research before you come to the park. So if you can choose those hikes, I mean, just, you know, you know the one you want to go to, but then you have all of those plan B, C, you can, you have, you have plans to go. Yeah, we actually to. have one of the categories that Madison was talking about on our website is how to avoid crowds. So one of those categories is trails that we love that are lesser known, that are lesser used. Um, and you can choose one of those, uh, especially during October. Yep. So we are going to hopefully answer some questions. Do we have any, Claire? Um, well, if folks want to um, get any questions in for Tegan and, and Cindy before they have to go, please let us know. Um, one great question we have is, do we need to get a ticket in advance for getting into the park? You don't have to, but especially in October when we get those lines, it can be very helpful. Go ahead and get your ticket on recreation.gov, your entrance permit, and then uh, we'll have lanes for people who already have their passes or their permits. And we have both annual passes and day use passes. 
passes were actually they're good for a week. But um, you can grab those in advance and that will speed up your entry when it's um, when it's when it's crowded. But if you don't, you know, if you come kind of on a whim and you didn't have time to get it, that's okay too. You don't have to have it. But and there we are not like some of the other parks that have timed entry or you know um, limited entry here in the park. Now old rag hiking is different, but in the park um, yes, you can get it in advance, but you don't have to. Uh, how is the weather in late October typically, Alyssa? Kind of like this today. It's windy and cold. Um, in late October? Yeah, I would say that the days are pretty clear. Kind of like, again, like today. Pretty windy. We're going to see a lot more color in late October, so there's that to look forward to. But you probably want a, a jacket <laughs> and some pants and some good closed toed shoes, especially if you're up here to hike, but then it'll just keep you really snug and warm. Layers, yeah. wear layers. Layers, yeah. lots of layers. We've seen it 90, we've seen it snow in October. <laughs> yeah. right. It's, it's yeah. always good to remember that it's colder up here than it is yeah. where you're coming from at the bottom yeah. of the mountain. At least by so. 10 degrees, yep. yeah. pretty much. Um, one of the questions is, is when does the park open and close? Generally, the park is open 24-7. However, if we have snow or some other um, emergency, then we may need to close parts of Skyline Drive or the entire Skyline Drive. You can still come into the park and hike, but you can't access a lot of the trailheads um, from the from Skyline Drive during that time if, if, it, if it's closed. So it's a good idea to, again, monitor our social media. And then very soon for this winter, we're going to have a new system that you can opt into and we'll send you updates on the Skyline Drive status. So we hope to have um, more information on how you do that next week, but that, that'll, that'll happen soon. But generally, we're open 24-7. Um, here you go. Is fall foliage on peak right now? <laughs> we are not at peak yet. Um, if you look at our video that we did last week, we had our park botanist Wendy Cass with us. And she did a beautiful description of what peak can look like. And she had her, um, her guess as to when that might be. And she gave us a range in that late, mid to late October is when she thinks that peak will be. But again, it might vary depending on what part of the park you're in because it does differ in elevation. Uh, and we will keep you updated on social media. We're gonna post pictures and then every week, if you keep watching this broadcast, we'll keep you up to date as well. If you have any questions at all, just make sure that you're putting them in the comments and Claire will read them to us and we will try to answer as many as we can. If you are staying at a campground in the park, such as Loft Mountain, do we need to pay for additional entrance to the park? Yes. No, so your entrance to the park gets you into the park. There will be an additional fee for a campsite and you'll purchase that on recreation.gov. Um, so I don't see any additional questions right now. Right. Anybody has any safety questions or questions yeah. for our chief ranger or our search and rescue ranger please let me know we'll give it another minute we know these guys are really busy especially in the fall season we'll keep them around for just a moment if you have any questions for them um i guess i have one question <laughs> when do you guys think people will be <laughs> it's always our favorite question to ask people even if i just gave the answer minutes before if you weren't listening <laughs> i think it looks like it's kind of going I think so too because it's going to be really chilly a lot earlier this year than it has in even like the past two years that I can remember so I think it could be a little earlier but I might argue with our botanist. <laughs> <laughs> and Lisa wants to know about how many rangers work in the park um, and do you get to pick your park when you apply? So you do get to pick what park you want to work in. That have a combination of permanent rangers that work here year-round and then like a lot of other parks we have seasonal rangers that we hire to work uh, mainly summer fall the busiest time 
Um, and so every year those rangers apply for positions and they get to choose where they go. Right now, um, we currently have 17-ish permanent rangers and then we have uh, an additional 10 more between um, law enforcement and the, the star rangers like with TV and Zooey to help provide EMS search and rescue. So it varies, the, the temporary employees that we hire varies every year, but the goal That's for for law enforcement rangers. Total rangers in the park. Yes. I think during the um, off season, when it's just permanent staff, it's about between 50 and 75, right? And then total, when we have everybody in, it's up in the 200s. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, for for all of the employees mm -hmm. in the park, uh, the 200 sounds about right. Yes, I know. In the summer, within just our division, it's about 80 or 90 wow. employees. So yeah. Um, so what, why is red the first color leaf to change? Actually, I think Wendy told us last week that yellow is, and then some red. It depends on the species rather than the, the color. And, and each species ch changes a different color. So like when she mentioned the, um, the Virginia creeper, that's just one, that species is one of the first to change and it goes red. Um, I also mentioned the maple. I yeah. thought it only turned red, and then Neil informed me they can also turn yellow because <laughs> they're different species. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, what's the favorite part of your job? Cindy, why don't you start? <laughs> <laughs> My favorite part is... Um, I know the cliche answer obviously is helping people. But I would say uh, helping employees really is, I get a lot of satisfaction out of um, supporting them, helping them, you know, develop, get get where they want to be in their careers. And I feel uh, that just, that's what makes me happy when I come to work. Uh, I do also love very much <laughs> the resource itself, like getting to come to Shenandoah as my job is pretty amazing. So I would say the location is also great. <laughs> it's a perk. <laughs> it's a perk, yeah. Um, so Tegan, here's one for you. Okay. Uh, what wildlife concerns for overnight camping do you have? Do you recommend bear spray or what, what can you talk about with the wildlife? So... Um, bears don't really attack people. Um, really when they attack like people, it's if you startle them. So if you're making a lot of noise when you're hiking, they're, they're going to stay away from you. They do not like noise. Um, bears do think dogs are the apex predator. So you want to make sure you're keeping your dog on a leash because um, they will attack dogs because they think they're a threat. Um, and we're talking about black bears in Shenandoah. They're much less aggressive. We're not talking about grizzlies yeah, yeah, yeah. in it's the like western parts, story. but in <laughs> we don't have Shenandoah. I think probably the most important thing is your food storage. Yeah. You know, yeah. Be sure that you don't have anything with you that bears can sense or smell. They will fight you for your backpack. They don't mean to hurt you, but if you have a hot dog in your hand, you know? <laughs> So yeah, I think think just proper food storage. And when we say food, we mean not only food, but any what, what we call smellables. The, smellables. the wildlife biologist okay. makes fun of us for saying yeah. smellables. Yeah, and smellables. if you do exit your tent at night, uh, make sure you have a flashlight. Um, you have, have people who stepped on a snake at night. So yeah. hopefully they won't have to worry about that when it gets cold, right? Yeah. <laughs> hopefully not this time yeah, of year. The, the huts that are along the AT. There are bear boxes that you can use. The campgrounds also have storage places right. for you to put food. Um, but if you're in the back country, you know there is um, there are recommendations for how you can like hang your your items in the tree that are supposed to help keep the bears from getting those things. Um, but yeah, I think we're fortunate here that the bears are not super aggressive like they can be out west. It's a different. 
the food source is for anything scented. So if you have scented lotion, you would also want to pack that away so animals don't smell it. Good. All right. Well, if we don't have any more questions, we are going to wrap things up here. Um, but if you do want to put a question in a comment, we will get back to you later because we want to make sure that everybody feels super informed before they come to the park. But I want to thank you both for joining us today. We learned a lot from you and I think a lot of good takeaways. So thank you very much. Yeah. All right. We will see you all again next week, Thursday at 2 p.m. And we will take questions again at that time. And we hope that you enjoy your safe and fun weekend. All right.